with what you do. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for, for that, Charlotte. We appreciate uh, that contribution. Um, I think I've got 10 o'clock a.m. And so we have a few announcements this morning. And so we'll wanna go ahead and get started. And I would like to uh, give everyone a very heartfelt welcome to the Scottish American History Award. Plus, I, I want to give a shout out to a new board member, a new Board of Governors member, uh, Heather Holmes de Blasio, who I believe is on the call this morning. And welcome, Heather. We're, we're very much looking forward to working with you. And as you know, as you all know, the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots, formerly the Illinois St. Andrews Society, which founded the oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois in 1845, later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care located in North Riverside, Illinois. Chicago Scots is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and the celebration of Scottish culture, in addition to support of Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. So for additional information, we'd like you all to please access our website, www.chicagoscots.org and please give generously to our Caledonia Senior Care Charity. And now before we do begin our presentation with question and answer afterwards with Dr. Bruce Allardyce, we are delighted, uh, I see you Gus, to have Gus Noble, president of Caledonia and Chicago Scots with us today to greet everyone and to update us on the latest at Caledonia. Gus, please. Well, thank you very much, Connie, and good morning, everyone. I hope uh, everyone is ill, hearty, happy, healthy, and all that good stuff. Um, I'll apologize for any noise that my uh, eight-year-old and four-year-old assistants may make in the background. They're feeling pretty and particularly rambunctious this morning, but uh, I'll keep it brief so they don't have an opportunity to disturb us. Um, I, uh, I appreciate Connie giving us the opportunity to bring you an update from Caledonia. Uh, all is well. We have uh, gone through a very challenging time as, as all of us have over the last three years, but particularly those of us who work in and live in the field of long-term care and senior care have seen COVID-19 fix its ugly sights on uh, the people in this particular field. But Caledonia has really come through with uh, colours that are as impeccably successful and safe as any other community I know. And that's really due to the, the commitment to care that everybody has made. And that, that commitment has become ever more uh, tricky, expensive, hard to do by COVID, by the regulations it entails, by competition, by all of these things, and a small not-for-profit nursing home. Oh, we lost you, Gus. You're muted. Gus, you got muted. I apologize. How's that? It, it wasn't me, I promise. Uh, somebody muted me and maybe you're trying to tell me something Jack so I'll, I'll hurry it along I just what I wanted to say was we've, we've got through this tricky time care the care we deliver is hard to do it's expensive to do but it's worth it it's the right thing to do so though it is we're finding all these challenges in front of us I surely do appreciate the uh, the commitment and the support of uh, people who are on this call today and, and beyond into the community who really helped us through. You should know that though the care is expensive, I say this with enthusiasm that is absolutely unreserved. It is the best and it's worth it. So I, I appreciate it. Um, I also wanted to give you an update on Burns. We've just got through Robert Burns season. So I'm 
particularly full of haggis and good whiskey. Um, I am usually, but especially so at the moment. Good poetry still ringing in my ears. And as I look forward from Robert Burns, the next big, big event that we have coming up is our uh, Scottish Festival in Highland Games in the middle of the year. And I'm grateful to Jim Sim, who I think I see on the call, for giving leadership to the bagpiping and drumming uh, championship that we have there, which is for another year going to be the largest in North America. And here's here's the big headline we want you all to know. We've added a grade one competition. So the best pipe bands in North America and from around the world will be in Chicago to, to pipe and drum for us. So we're very excited and I appreciate Jim uh, very, very much. Appreciate you, Connie. I'm really listen, uh, looking forward to hearing Bruce. I've always enjoyed, Bruce, the things you've said and, and written. And uh, Robert, the Bruce is a, a particular favourite subject of mine. So I appreciate the, you making the time for us all today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gus. Thank you so much for being with us and, and your inspirational words, as always. Thank you. Um, you know, I would like to go ahead and, ha and state a few announcements this morning. And um, I, I'd also like, uh, David Furlow, I see you're on, and I'm going to call on you in just a minute because I'd like you to tell everybody about your new Lake Forest book, if you will. So get ready, and I'll be calling on you in just a jiffy. Uh, but I have three announcements this morning. First, uh, just a reminder that we are sticking to the 10 o'clock a.m. time frame in 2023 but we'll be meeting on the second Saturdays of the month. There's been a little bit of confusion about that and I, I need to make sure we get the word out. Um, also, you'll see that um, Jack has put a slide up on the screen and it's a little bit uh, hard to see with, with all the faces, but uh, we're so pleased to share what the Scottish Government USA is doing to commemorate Black History Month which is now in February. And there are two wonderful documentary films by Parissa Urquhart uh, that are available on TV via On Demand. Uh, the first being Strike for Freedom, which discusses Frederick Douglass's monumental work with black abolitionists in Edinburgh which inspired thousands to join the anti-slavery campaign back in the 18th century. And the second film, Scotland, Statues and Slavery, uh, which is a film that won the BBC Best Single Documentary Award, exploring Scotland's involvement in the slave trade and its impact and, and commemoration today. And so uh, for additional information on that, just simply go to the Scottish Government USA, either their Twitter site or Facebook, and, it, and it's all right there for you. And thank you so much for joining Chicago Scots in celebrating Black History Month. Um, and then thirdly, I would just like to remind everyone that next month on March 11th, Dr. Colin Nicholson, professor and editor of the Bernard Papers, History and Politics at the University of Stirling in Scotland, will be joining us to discuss founding father and second president of the United States, John Adams. So you definitely won't want to miss that. And now I believe it's time to move forward with our presentation today. We are also very excited to have Bruce Allardyce, Doctor of Jurisprudence and Instructor in History and Political Science at South Suburban College. And of course, everyone knows that Bruce plans to tell us about Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland. So Bruce, we're ready to turn the show over to you, please now, and we will be muting everyone and uh, turning off your cameras until the Q&A at the end. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Connie. Uh, let's go to the share screen here. Pleased again to be uh, speaking before the uh, Scottish uh, enthusiast I see here on the screen. Uh, my topic today is uh, 
hopefully something that'll be of interest to people. I call it Robert the Bruce, the real Braveheart. And of course, here's two depictions of Robert the Bruce. As we'll see later, neither of them comes anywhere close to the real Bruce. Man, when I was a kid. My name is Bruce Stewart Allardyce. And my brother was Robert Douglas Allardyce. Between the two first names of Bruce, Robert, Douglas, and Stewart, my parents probably unknowingly uh, set me on the path to being interested in the story of Robert the Bruce and of his great companions, the Black Douglas and Sir Walter Stewart. Now, when I was a uh, kid, I won't say how many years ago, uh, I was raised on this book that I'm showing you right here, P. Hume's Brown Short, Brown's Short History of Scotland. It was one of the few books that uh, my grandparents had brought from Dundee with them to the United States. And uh, I was fascinated by the stories in the book. Uh, not just the stories of Robert the Bruce and that, but especially the stories of William Wallace, of Robert the Bruce, of the poets Barber and Blind Harry. So my interest was all, always there. But when I got to the college again a long time ago, I, I started to research the real Robert the Bruce, the person beyond the legends, beyond the stories. And that research is the foundation of my presentation today. Now, if Americans know Robert the Bruce at all, they know him from the movie Braveheart, the 1995 hit movie starring uh, Mel Gibson as William Wallace. But there's scads of Robert the Bruce things going around these days. Many of them inspired by this movie. First of all, beer. This is a picture of Robert the Bruce Ale. Uh, by the way, this is a very good ale. If you're looking for that, it's made by a place in Munster and Siena called Three Floyds. One of the best ales I've ever had. And not because of the name alone. First, Scotch whiskey. Robert the Bruce, Glenn Fittich, Scotch whiskey. Video games. Yes, there's even a Robert the Bruce character in one of the video games, uh, Civilization VI to be exact. I mean, that's uh, sort of a cartoon picture of Robert the Bruce. Currency banknotes. Uh, Scott, the Scottish authority issued commemorative 20 pound banknotes with Robert the Bruce's picture on it and the anniversary of the 700th year after he'd been crowned King of Scotland in 1306. I can add comic books, I can add postage stamps. He seems to be everywhere these days. And there's lots of move, recent movies on the Bruce, so even after the Braveheart. Here's Angus Nefadian, who played the Bruce in the Braveheart, 24 years later, he makes another movie called Robert the Bruce, uh, reprising his role. The movie Outlaw King in 2018, starring uh, the Hollywood actor Chris Pine. A TV series in Bit Britain. Here's David Paisley portraying the Bruce in Rising of the Clans. And just a year after Braveheart, they made a movie called The Bruce. Don't watch this movie, by the way. Uh, this is Sandy Welch as Robert the Bruce. And as one reviewer wrote, if I was Scottish and I watched this movie, I'd be tempted to fight for the English. I'm going to do another sharing here. Um, give me a second here.
this is the uh, this is a clip from the trailer of the movie of Robert the Bruce. Okay, let me know if you can't see or hear it. You want the one thing you cannot have to be William Wallace, to be loved as he was. And that is why you will not become king of Scotland. Any man who breaks the head of Robert the Bruce shall receive 50 gold pieces. Let us a reward. We'll have it for ourselves. Freedom. I'll show him the meaning of it. Who is he? It's Robert the Bruce. I shall leave here soon. You'll leave when you're well. Healing me is treason in these lands. You're my king, and we'll defend you the best we can. So try and low! We'll find him here! You'd fight our king to the death. He's no king of mine. <laughs> Scotland is clutched in the grip of a mighty hand. Now, we'll set her free. Is that not worth fighting for? What if he marries his army? Tell me that you'll lead us. Tell me, and we will fight again. We need to know our men die for something. Ah! I am Robert the Bruce. It is time we fight. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie already, but it's uh, actually a very interesting movie. Sadly enough, uh, a movie about the uh, hero of Scotland. It was shot actually in mostly in Canada. Well, we've seen the Bruce. in the movies, but what is and who is the historical Scottish hero Robert the First King of Scotland? A brief note on the historiography. Even today, many things are unknown about Bruce and his family. Historians are forced to rely on some surviving government documents, both English and Scottish, on the contemporary chronicles of some monks, and the post facto, after the fact, poems of Blind Harry and Barber in Geralia. But with that caveat, we should start with his family. This is a prominent family connected not just to the Scottish royal family, but to most of the noble families of Scotland and England. The Bruces came from England to from Normandy in France in 1106. Clan Bruce descends from Robert de Bruce, first Lord of Annandale, who came to England in 1106. He was a companion in arms to the then Prince David of Scotland. We followed north in 1124 to help reclaim his kingdom. Their mission was successful. David won the throne, became David the first King of Scotland. And King David rewarded Robert Bruce by giving him the lordship of Annandale in southern Scotland. It's a brief family tree here. Most notably, they became a lot closer to the royal family when in 1219, Robert the fourth Lord of Annandale married Isabel of Huntington. Now she was the daughter of Prince David of Scotland. Yeah, that we could do anything. Little girl. Not really tomorrow. Everything okay? Could everyone mute your microphones, please? We appreciate it. Thank you. Now, this uh, David of Huntington was had been inherited the English earldom of Huntington, and he was the brother of William the First, the Lion, King of Scotland. The union made the Bruce family hugely wealthy thanks to lands in England as well as Scotland. 
In fact, the family lands in England, which was part of the inheritance he got from the earldom of Huntington, made the family as much English as Scots, and in all probability, they derived more income from their English lands than from their Scottish lands. This Robert's son, Robert V, Lord of Annandale, later known as the Claimant, he played a prominent part in the English Civil Wars of 1264 and 65. He served in high government posts in both England and Scotland. He married into the highest English nobility and was one of the most influential men in both countries. Of him, the Chronicle of Lanarkos said, quote, he was a handsome appearance, a gifted speaker, remarkable for his influence, and what is more important, most devoted to God and the clergy. It was his custom to entertain and feast more liberally than all the other courtiers, and was most hospitable to all his guests. Well, in 1238, his then childless first cousin, King Alexander II, designated Robert, this Robert the Bruce, heir presumptive to the Scottish throne. The birth of the future Alexander III, three years later, uh, scotched Robert's hopes for the crown immediately. But the memory of his being named heir to the throne raised his hope when 50 years later, the throne again became vacant. And as we'll see, this Robert's grandson, known as Robert the Bruce, will become King of Scotland. Now, there are numerous Bruce descendants today, um, including the Earls of Elgin and Kincardine. I should note that they are not descended from King Robert the Bruce or his brothers. Uh, he's going to have many brothers and sisters. He's going to have, in fact, uh, not just his brother Edward, but nine other brothers and sisters. It's a large family. Now, the younger Robert, the future King Robert I, must have had book learning as a youth, though no records survive of his education. He would have spoken the Norman French of his peers, as well as the Gaelic language of his household. In his grandfather's house, he would have heard spoken and learned the Northern English dialect, which was to become the broad Scots of later generations. The trilingual Robert was also trained, like most noble youths, in the handling of arms and the management of horses. In his prime, the powerful Robert was ranked as the, one of the three most accomplished knights in Christendom. As he is growing up, Alexander III is king of Scotland. Good, very successful king, keeps Scotland at peace, basically. He defeats the king of Norway and gets the Scottish Isles, Western Isles, to become part of Scotland again. Unfortunately for King Alexander, his three children die. But there's no worries about his siring more kids. He was um, quite the ladies' man, and evidently he would go around at night in disguise and visit local um, women of obliging disposition and um, spend the night with them. Well, but he, he wants to have more kids, though, and he marries, a, he marries his second wife, a very young French princess. And on March 18th, 1286, King Alexander calls a meeting of his council in Edinburgh, followed by a basically a wine and beer fest. Thoughts of his young wife he had left in the royal palace and Kinghorn, 20 miles away on the opposite bank of the Firth of Forth, grew more alluring with the more wine he had. In spite of storms outside and the ejections of his nobles, he called for his horse and followed by only three squires, made haste to the ferry at Domini. When he reached the village of Domini, the ferry master urged on the king the hazards of the crossing and begged him to return to Edinburgh. Are you afraid to die with me? asked the king. 
By no means, replied the fairy master. I could not die better than in the company of my monarch. Well, they made the two-mile crossing safely to be met by the royal purveyor on the other side of the Firth of Forth, who, recognizing the king's voice in the utter darkness, called out, My lord, what are you doing here in such storm and darkness? How often have I not tried to persuade you that these midnight rambles will do you no good? Stay with us, and we will provide you with all that you want until the morning light. But the king ignored the warnings and set off on the road to Kinghorn. In the howling wind and darkness, the little party lost all contact with each other. The next morning, the squires, who'd reached Kinghorn safely, were shocked to learn that King Alexander had not yet arrived. A search party was formed, and the king was found dead on the seashore below a cliff, his neck broken in a fall. In the darkness, he accidentally rode over the cliff and killed himself. And pictured here is the monument uh, where he uh, was found slain. Well, his only descendant was his granddaughter, the Princess Margaret, four years old, daughter of the King of Norway and, his de and Alexander's deceased daughter. Guardianships are set up for the kingdom and she's allowed to stay in Norway until she's considered old enough to make the hazardous voyage to Scotland. Well, she does four years later in 1290, but she dies during the voyage. There's no close heirs to the throne nor any accepted laws of succession as to who succeeds to the throne. There are essentially no less than 13 different people claiming to now be King of Scotland. The ones with the best claim according to popular belief and whatever law there was were um, not the illegitimate children of King William the Lion, Alexander's grandfather, but the legitimately descended descendants of David, Earl of Huntington, William the Lion's brother. As you can see the family tree above. David was King Alexander's closest legitimate male relative. Now the Scots can't agree on who should be the new king. So they called in King Edward I of England, sometimes known as Long. Thanks. Now, Edward of England had been King Alexander's brother-in-law. Alexander had married his sister. They were close friends. And England and Scotland had been in peace for the longest time. They called upon Edward to arbitrate. Now, King Edward makes the Scots leaders swear that whoever he chooses as king must swear an oath of allegiance to him, essentially making the next king of Scotland his vassal. He then establishes a court to decide. Of the 13 candidates, in reality, there's only a few serious candidates. The Ill illegitimate descended contenders were never in the running and just probably wanted to have their moment in glory by pushing forth their claim. The English Count of Hereford was too English to be considered. Of those remaining, David's, uh, the descendant of David's sister, the Count of Holland, claimed that he had a document saying that David had renounced the throne for him and his descendants, which meant that all of the claims of David's descendants were void. King Edward and the court gave uh, the Count of Holland a 10-month recess to prove his claim, but in the end, uh, when the court resumed, uh, couldn't find the document. Florence couldn't find the document, probably never existed in the first place. So that leaves the choice essentially between three claimants, John Balliol, a French knight, Robert the Bruce, who we've talked about already, and John, an English lord, 
Lord Hastings. Now, the accepted law in Western Europe for descent was known as primal genitor, which is a fancy way of saying firstborn. John Balliol was descended from the eldest daughter of David Earl of Huntington. However, Robert the Bruce made a couple other claims. He said, first of all, the primogenitor would have never been the tradition in Scotland, that in Scotland, the older tradition was that the older ma oldest male heir of the deceased would inherit. He also mentioned that he had been named heir to the throne 50 years earlier. The third claimant, John Hastings, uh, didn't try to argue even that he should be king, but rather he claimed that since David, Prince David had three daughters, the kingdom should be divided into three and he should get one third of the kingdom. Huh. Well, the court was forced to consider, first of all, which law would apply, and they decided primogenitor rather than your uh, King Edward, in fact, uh, asked uh, various lawyers, including those of the University of Paris, to uh, pronounce on this point. And they decided, and these lawyers and the, these experts decided the primogenitor had to be the law of succession, and the, a kingdom could not be divided among its heirs. And thus, in 1292, John Balliol was named the rightful king of Scotland. Now, this decision has been uh, criticized by many Scots, but uh, at least technically, the decision that Edward and the court made was legally correct. Of course, here's King Edward I, Longshanks and Braveheart. But of course, King Edward had other agendas besides the strict uh, legality of succession laws. One story has it that King Edward at first leaned to Robert the Bruce, Robert Bruce, until one shrewd advisor pointed out to Edward that if, quote, Bruce were king, where would Edward be of King of England be? For this, Robert is of the noblest stock in all of England, and together with him, the kingdom of Scotland is very strong of itself, and in times gone by, a great deal of mischief has been wrought to England by kings of Scotland. To which Edward replied, quote, by Christ's blood thou hast sung well. Things shall go otherwise than I arranged at first. For Edward of England, John Balliol was the perfect choice for king. He was an Anglo-French knight who never quit set foot in Scotland. He was backed by his uncle's family, the Commons, arguably the most a powerful family in Scotland. But he was known to be a weak man with no connections to Scotland, no real loyalty to Scotland. As king, the Scots named him, nicknamed him Tomb Tabard, the Empty Cloak. Now, Balliol actually tries to be a sort of independent king. But Edward reminds him that he's, you know, as king, you're England's vassal. And he starts to order Balliol about. Balliol objects. Edward musters an English army. Edward, by the way, is, the, is considered the greatest English general of his age. And he deposes Balliol and essentially takes over Scotland. Now, the Scottish nobles, especially those living near the border with England, are afraid of England's overwhelming might. Remember, England at this time has 10 times the people and many more than 10 times the wealth that, England, that Scotland has. And so in order to save their lands from being destroyed or being taken over, they publicly acquiesce in the English takeover. Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, the claimant's son, and Robert the Bruce, the grandson of the future king, are no exceptions. 
they waver between being uh, for independence and for acquiescing in England's domination. But these nobles are not loyal to England, perhaps in their heads. As one English chronicler shrewdly observed, quote, even when the lords are present with the king and body, at heart, they were with the opposite side. Now we all know about the movie Braveheart. It should be remembered, and this is brought out in the movie, that Robert the Bruce is not the head of the Bruce family when William Wallace is raising his rebellion. His father, Robert Earl of Carrick, was the head. And the, Robert the Bruce will not be the head of the family until 1304. Well, quick quiz. How many kings of Scotland are named Robert? Okay. Well, the answer is three. Our Robert the First, his grandson Robert the Second, and great grandson Robert the Third. Now, as we know, Wallace was defeated by Longshanks at the Battle of Falkirk in 1298 and resigns his leadership of Scotland. Young Robert the Bruce and the head of the common family, John the Redcom and his rival, were named joint guardians of the, of the kingdom temporarily, which is quite a mark of respect for the young Robert because he's not even the head of the Bruce family. But the war of conquest could not be stopped by the outnumbered Scots, and they sort of made their peace. Well, who is this Robert the Bruce? Well, remember the depictions I showed you? This is what he really looked like. Do any of these actors resemble this man? No. While researching the movie, The Outlaw King, the movie makers learned that the tomb of Robert the Bruce had been discovered in uh, 1817 inside the church. Contained inside a rotted wooden coffin was the skeleton of the King of the Scots. It was encased in lead and covered by fragments of the cloth of gold shroud. A plaster cast was taken of his skull before the remains were reburied a few months later. Some items were not reinterred, including a foot bone, the shroud, pieces of the coffin, and part of the tomb, which are on display at the University of Glasgow today. Two centuries after the discovery of Robert the Bruce's skull, historians were able to make use of the cast of the skull to digitally reconstruct the face of the Scottish king. Uh, according to the uh, craniological facial expert, that using the skull cast, we could accurately establish the muscle formation from the positions of the skull bones to determine the shape and structure of the face. But what the reconstruction cannot show is the color of his eyes, his skin tones, and the color of his hair. The shown digital reconstruction revealed a large and formidable head supported by a muscular neck and a stocky body. Robert the Bruce's large head indicates that he was likely very intelligent. Well, Robert the Bruce's father dies in 1304, and he's now more free to pursue the crown. Now, Edward I knew Robert the Bruce, and, vice, and he knew both Robert, King Edward and his son, the future Edward II. Edward I knew him and realized that this guy has personal qualities. He could be a lot of trouble if he ever rebels. He was known as a, a wise man, strong knight, a good leader. In 1306, Robert the Bruce visited his estates in England. Now, Longshanks had long suspected Bruce's loyalty to himself, got word that Bruce was thinking of rebellion, and one night, 
after just presumed too much wine drinking, Longshanks let slip that he intended to arrest Robert and try him for treason. Among the king's guests that night was the Earl of Gloucester, the king's nephew, probably the richest noble in England, whose family had been friends and neighbors of the Bruce family and who were linked by marriage to Robert the Bruce. Gloucester sent a servant to Robert the Bruce with a gift of golden spurs. Bruce may have sensed the danger of arrest and arranged with his friend Gloucester to send him this signal if arrest were imminent, or perhaps he was quick to take the hint. In any event, he, uh, Bruce sent his squire secretly to saddle two horses, pretended to retire the meeting, and then in the middle of the night slipped away and rode hell for level, hell for leather for, for his family castle in Scotland. To carry out his quest for the crown, he wanted to make a some sort of agreement with a very powerful common family and their leader, John the Red Com John the Red Common. Common agreed to support Bruce's bid for kingship in exchange for Bruce giving Common all of his lands. However, Common had second thoughts. Still fearful of England's might, he informed Longshanks about Bruce wanting to rebel. Now, Bruce heard of this and confronted Common. A fight ensued, and Bruce stabbed his rival. This picture here. One of, he went outside, and one of his attendants asked him whether he killed Common, and Bruce said, I'm not sure. So the attendant went into the church and finished Common off, muttering, I'm that sicker. I'll make sure. This murder marks Bruce's crossing of the Rubicon. Now wanted by the English and by Common's many relatives, by the way, for murder, he boldly claimed the Scottish throne. He's crowned at Scone near Perth in 1306 by a national assembly, except perhaps the Common family. Edward sends an army after him after uh, with one of his veteran generals. Robert the Bruce challenges the English army to general. He's got an army of his own. The English guy says, well, it's too late in the day to have a battle. Tell you what, we'll have a battle tomorrow morning. And so Bruce and his army retire for the night, trusting the, the English noble's word. Doesn't post any scouts. And in the middle of the night, the English army makes a surprise attack on the sleeping Scots. This is the Battle of Methven. The Scottish army is routed and flees. Bruce flees to the highlands. He leaves his wife, his young daughter, and his younger brothers in a castle for protection. The English take the castle. One of the, one of the garrison of the castle betrays Bruce's family. They seize and execute the brothers, and they imprison Bruce's wife and daughter, and they're going to be in prison for eight years in England. Well, after this disaster in the, at Methven, Bruce is, is reduced to leading a small band of diehards, wandering the hills and forests, often hungry hunted by the Scots and the English. Two stories illustrate his time of struggles. One, when his diminished band was pursued by a hostile Highland clan, Bruce stationed himself as a one-man rear guard to fend off the pursuers. The Lord of Lorne, at the head of the pursuit, ordered a father and two sons to race along the hillside and ambush Robert at a place where the path was so narrow that a horse could hardly turn. As Bruce passed beneath the three, they leapt on him. One son seized Bruce's bridle, but he had his arm and shoulder cut from his body by one stroke of Bruce's mighty sword. Then Bruce killed the father and the other son, splitting the other son with his sword. And when the bulk of the pursuers saw Bruce kill the three single-handed, they were afraid to follow Bruce any further and fell back. 
Another time, a Scot who was with Bruce agreed to betray the Bruce to the English in return for 40 pounds of gold, which was a fortune at the time. The traitor knew that the Bruce retired every morning into a covert uh, out, of a, out of sight of his camp forces, accompanied only by a single young page, in order to relieve himself. So the traitor and his two sons approached Bruce, intending to attack and kill him. When Bruce saw the three approaching, he instantly sensed danger and he asked his page for a weapon. The page replied that he had only a bow and arrow, at which the Bruce said, then give them to me quickly and stand far back, for if I win, you shall have weapons enough, but if I die, make haste away. The three armed men drew near, professing peaceful intention. Bruce raised his bow and let fly with an arrow with such force that it pierced the father through the eye and knocked him backwards. The elder son attacked Bruce with an ax, but Bruce, who always carried his great sword hanging from his neck, had it ready and cut the elder son down with a single stroke. Bruce then turned on the other son who was running at him with a spear, sliced off the spear point and then cut him down. But Bruce was in trouble. He was driven to refuge on the Isle of Iran off the, off the western coast and seriously wondered should he keep trying to become king when it seemed that the overwhelming might of England and much of Scotland was against him. And of course, this is the famous story of the spider. Bruce is in a cave on the Isle of Iran. And he sees a spider trying to spin a web and trying to go from one rock to the other. And the spider fails six times in his attempt to go from the one rock to the other. But on the seventh attempt, the spider finally succeeds. And Bruce has tried six times to... Uh, raise a good revolt and become king and has failed all six times and according to the story he's inspired to try a seventh and last time to do this he had been waiting for partisans on the mainland to give him a single that it was safe to land again on the mainland and on the appointed day a light was seen on the mainland you can see the mainland of scotland from the Isle of Iran, and bruce embarked his tiny force on a few ships on landing, he learned that the signal fire had been lit by accident, that it wasn't a single, and that there were local English garrisons and armies all around. It seemed folly to attempt to penetrate the hostile country with his tiled force. But his brother Edward, who was known to be rash, spoke for all when he explained, No peril shall drive me back to the sea. Here I will take my chances, good or bad. Robert agreed and promptly launched a nighttime surprise attack against the local English command. All but one of the, of the sleeping English were killed. The one survivor fled to the nearest English-held castle, spreading word of Bruce's return. Bruce's men feasted on the English booty, booty then disappeared into the mountains of southwest Scotland to wage what we would now be called guerrilla warfare. Robert the Bruce's greatness as a general is indicated by the military revolution he created in Scotland. Scottish armies largely before this had tried to fight pitched battles against the English. They were inevitably outnumbered and out-equipped and would be defeated. Because, of course, England, Scotland is a much poorer country, a much smaller country than England. Robert the Bruce's brilliant thought was to use Scotland's poorness to its advantage. Because the large armies that England could put into the field and march into Scotland, well, in those days, Armies lived by uh, plundering the countryside. They couldn't, there were no uh, railroads to bring supplies to them. And so if the Scots could avoid the main army, pick off uh, 
those English parties that were trying to collect food from the countryside and generally wage guerrilla war, they could wear down the English and defeat the English invasions. Now there's a, a downside of this, of course, you're abandoning part of your country to just essentially be looted by the English. But he believed that was better than getting defeated and wiped out. Here is the one battle they had and during this period, Loudon Hill, where he defeats a small English army uh, using uh, brilliant tactics. For the first year, Bruce is sort of a guerrilla warfare leader. Edward I is furious at this rebellion, and he musters again another large English family to put this Robert the Bruce down once and for all. But Edward I dies before he can reach Scotland. He tells his son Edward II to carry on the campaign and in fact carry his bones with the army to inspire them to finish off Scotland once and for all. But Edward II is not Edward I, as I think the movie Braveheart shows. Um, Bruce is known to have said, I was more afraid of the bones of Edward I than the real Edward II. Edward II soon abandons the campaign. He is very unpopular with the English lords because he elevates obscure but very young and good looking knights uh, to be nobles and council and everything. He ignores the traditional English lords. And for the next six years, literally, he's fighting civil wars in England just to establish himself as king over the opposition. In this distraction, that's Bruce's opportunity. There's a lot of great opportunity. There's a lot of great stories about this. One by one, the English garrisons in Scotland surrenders. Robert the Bruce ravages the lands of Scots who are still opposed to him to get them to be loyal to him again. Uh, Robert the Bruce himself takes a party to capture the fortified town of Perth. Uh, what they do is he finds them, he detects a shallow spot in the moat surrounding the town and literally leads his troops in person to ford this moat and put ladders to get over the wall to get into the town. And, and a, okay. French, a French observer is amazed that a king will literally lead his forces personally. He said, this is, this is a great man because he's not ordering his troops to go somewhere. He's leading his troops in person. By 1314, the only major castle still held by the English in Scotland is the strategic castle of Stirling in the heart of the country. Now, Bruce's brother, Edward, is leading a force to uh, besiege it, basically starve it out. And Edward comes to an agreement with the uh, castle's commander. He said, if uh, the English don't relieve you this year, you got to surrender. That was a pretty common practice in that time, by the way. But this almost challenges King Edward II to come and relieve the castle. I mean, he's throwing, he's throwing a real challenge to the English, really public challenge. Uh, Robert the Bruce is admonishes his brother for being too rash. But here the showdown is going to come. Well, I talked a lot about Robert the Bruce, but he was not alone in his quest to free Scotland. He has a network of Bruce that they call Bruce's companions who become very famous. We have his, his greatest lieutenant, the Black Douglas, Sir James Douglas. His nephew, Sir Thomas Randolph. Sir Robert Keith, who commands the cavalry at the Battle of Bannockburn. His son-in-law, Sir Walter Stewart. 
his brother, Edward Bruce, his brother-in-law, Sir Neil Campbell. And these men are the founders of the meaning of many of the leading noble families of Scotland today. The older Celtic lines of nobility are dying out at this time. Between their dying out and Bruce's being able to confiscate the lands of nobles who are loyal to England, Bruce is able to reward his followers with vast lands and titles. The Bruce is also a, a very attractive man that men want to follow. One example is his nephew, Sir Thomas Randolph. Randolph had actually been on the side of the English for a while. He captures his nephew in battle and persuades him to join his side. And uh, Thomas Randolph later becomes the guardian of Scotland. This portrait is from the National Portrait Gallery and from the Hume Brown book I mentioned earlier. There's Robert the Bruce, uh, Wallace, the Black Douglas, Randolph, Earl of Moray, and some of the figures of the time. Well, Ben, the English must, or now Edward II gets a large army, including as basically one of the leaders, that Earl of Gloucester, who'd helped Bruce earlier. It outnumbers the Scottish army at least two to one. The Bruce counts on Edward II, though, not being a competent general, which is actually anybody who knew that was probably pretty confident in believing that. He prepares his battlefield very carefully. It's just south of Stirling. The road to Stirling crosses the Bannock Burn, a small water course that can get flooded quite often. There's marshy ground on either side. That Bruce has his men dig traps, essentially little holes with spikes to uh, unhorse the English cavalry charges. He also has time to train the Scottish army, which is almost all on foot. It's probably about 5,000 men, including and 500 horse cavalry. He, these are veteran soldiers who've been following him for years, and he has time to train him in the tactics that he wants them to uh, follow during this battle. This picture illustrates a very noted incident just the day before the battle. Bruce was riding riding a reconnaissance force ahead of his army, essentially. And an English knight named Sir Humphrey de Bowen saw this, galloped down the road, and tried to kill the Bruce. And the Bruce uh, didn't have a lance. He just had an axe. He didn't want to retreat in front of his army, so what he does is he De Bowen tries to spear him with a lance. Bruce avoids him, and as De Bowen gallops by, Bruce cuts the English knight's head off with his axe. And that inspires his army to do greater things. Well, during the night, uh, the English see that it's probably not a good idea to attack up this road. So they decide to go to their right and cross the Bannock Burn closer to the Firth of Forth. Bruce is counting on this. The English are crossing a burn. It's very diff hard banks. It's difficult to cross. They are all in confusion. Uh, Edward loses control of his army. Some his leaders want to do one thing. Another set of leaders want to do another. And he just doesn't try and give orders there. But most of the English army cross and there's take a position on the boggy ground east of uh, Robert's camp. And in the morning, Robert Bruce launches an attack with his infantry. Now, this was something that was never done, infantry attacking a cavalry force, armored knights. 
the Earl of Gloucester, who was probably the only sensible leader on the English side, as it turns out, said, well, you know, uh, let's not try and attack these Scots uh, with our cavalry right now. It's too boggy a ground. Somebody says, are you afraid to fight? And Gloucester says, no, I'm not. And leads a charge himself and gets killed early in the battle. Now, remember, this is the same Gloucester who was Robert the Bruce's friend. Well, the, Eng the Scots close with the English. The English are on muddy ground. Their horses can't operate very well. They're hemmed in. The English response, which would have been the response under Edward I, would have been to detach their archers, their, their longbowmen, to the side and shoot the Scots infantry to death with their arrows. Eventually, a few longbowmen do that, but Robert the Bruce has got a cavalry force, light cavalry specifically for that. And he charges and disperses the English archers before they can start shooting. As the battle reaches its height, the English see on what they think is another Scottish army coming to, to attack them. And they panic and retreat in a rout. The, the so-called other English arm, Scottish army was in fact uh, the camp followers and the supply wagon people of the Scottish army who saw that the Scots were winning the battle and decided to join in and maybe get some loot. Well, this is the largest single defeat that the English ever suffered at the hands of the Scots. So many English die in the retreat that the Bannock Burn is filled with the body of English and the last retreaters can actually walk over dry shod over the, the burn because there's so many dead bodies there. The pursuit is relentless. The Scots capture so many English nobles that they can hold them for ransom and the ransoms that the, their families pay to the Scots is enough basically to restore the Scots all the losses they had during English occupation. They almost captured King Edward himself. And after this battle, resistance in Scotland to King Robert basically vanishes. But of course, the Battle of Bannockburn doesn't end the fighting between England and Scotland. Edward II in England refuses to recognize Robert as the King of Scotland. Internally, the Bruce is still faced with minor revolts by pro-common nobles and other ambitious people, but he puts them down fairly easily. The Scots start to raid England to make England finally make peace with Scotland and recognize Robert as the king. And the raids led by Robert the Bruce or the Douglas or Randolph were very successful. The Scots basically raid and um, ravage the countryside. And then when the heavier, larger English army, sort of ponderous, goes after them, they just run around them and run back to Scotland. The English, of course, will raid Scotland, but the Scotland's have, Scots have the advantage here because there's a lot more loots, there's a lot more to loot in Eng the more prosperous England than there is in Scotland. In fact, in uh, there's a couple battles fought, small battles. Edward the first, second, Edward the second is almost killed in one of those battles by a secret Scots raid. And in 1327, at the Battle of Old Byland, the Scots win another battle in England against a royal English army. By the end of King, good King Robert's reign, Scotland is at peace with England internally and recovering its prosperity. Edward II has uh, influence with the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church and Christendom is Catholic, including Scotland. 
And Robert wants the Pope to recognize him as king, finally. And he and the Scots Parliament get together and issue the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320. It's essentially a letter to the Pope saying, please, Robert is the King of Scotland. Recognize him as such. This is one of the few medieval documents that have um, a true eloquence that can really last over time. And I'll quote from part of it. But from these countless evils the English set upon us, we have been set free by the help of him who through his afflicts yet heals and restores by our prince, lord, and king, Robert. He delivered his people out of the hands of our enemies, met toil and fatigue, hunger and peril, like another Maccabeus or Joshua, and bore them cheerfully. To him, Robert, as to the man to whom, by whom salvation has been wrought unto our people, we are bound both by law and by his merits that our freedom may be still maintained. And by him, come what may, we mean to stand. Yet, if he should give up what he has begun and agree, agree to make us for our kingdom, subject to the king of England or the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy and a subverter of his own right and ours and make some other man who is well able to defend us our king. For as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we be on any conditions be brought under English rule. It is in truth, not for glory, nor riches, nor honors that we are fighting, but for freedom. For that alone, which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. This is an extraordinary document with an emphasis on the people's will as the basis of government, not the king's orders. And this is one of the first great expressions of this concept. Now here's quiz question number two. What famous document was said to be inspired by this declaration of our breath? Was it the English Bill of Rights, the Brexit law, the US Declaration of Independence, or Lincoln's Gettysburg Address? Well, it's actually the US Declaration of Independence, which has an expression that the people's will should be governed, and not too dissimilar from this. Declaration of Arbroath. Now, king Robert the Bruce uh, lives till 1329. He's known as the good King Robert. Now his first wife was captured in prison in England along with his daughter Marjorie. Uh, so he didn't have a lot of kids by his first wife. Just one daughter who marries Sir Walter Stewart. And their son becomes King Robert II eventually and founds the Stuart dynasty. He marries again, and his second wife, Elizabeth de Berg, has his only son, legitimate son, King David II, who will succeed him at the age of five and reign for 42 years. And as I said, his grandson through his daughter established the Stuart dynasty, who uh, we know of today, and whose descendants are, of course, Charles III, King of England. If you want to know more about Robert the Bruce, there's many, many books on the subject. Again, my favorite is... Uh, Robert the Bruce by Ronald McNair Scott. It gives you the uh, immortal stories, but it also gives you um, the documentary facts that give you the context and perhaps some of the corrections to the historic stories.
And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today and uh, just encourage you to uh, use this opportunity right now to, to ask questions verbally or to uh, put them in the chat group. So again, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, bravo, bravo, Bruce. Maybe you can tell us, I don't know if you'd be willing to put that slide back up of you and Leslie, but speak okay. to what, what's going on there. <laughs> well, this was, uh, this was us at a, at a visit we had to, let me just get back to the share screen here, uh, to uh, Edinburgh, and, well, in Scotland in general, of course, in, uh, in 2011, and uh, at one of the kilt shops, I forget which one, but it's right off of uh, Princess Street, if I remember correctly. Uh, they had, uh, obviously, the outfits there and a backdrop where you can get your photo taken. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that's a, that's a really great photo. Uh, I just love it. We used it as a Christmas card that year, by the way. Uh, Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, very, very nicely done, Bruce. Honestly, that was tremendous. That was just exhilarating. So thank you very much. We'd like to open the floor to question, answer, and discussion, please. Don't be shy. Hi, my name is Bruce uh, Dedman. I'm from, uh, I'm speaking to you from north of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, in a little town called Dykesville, where we're watching people hopefully not fall through the ice this weekend. Um, uh, just a very basic question. What does the Bruce mean? I mean, you don't hear anything other, you know, you don't hear uh, the John or the Douglas. It, it's the Bruce. Um, what does that, where does that come from? Well, I think I, I, before we, we were talking a little bit before the uh, meeting and I, somebody else asked me a little bit about that and I, I touched on that. Um, De, Bru De Bruce was the more French pronunciation of his last name, uh, but uh, it's he's di differentiated from his father and grandfather who were also Robert De Bruce uh, by his accomplishments. And he was, I think, given the, the phrase the Bruce, the Bruce, because of his personal greatness and the greatness of his accomplishments. Again, the story with the clan McPherson was that for the McPhersons, there were only three people on earth who, who deserved to be called the, the Lord, the Pope, and the McPherson. <laughs> and I think that's part of it here. So, it, but does that refer to a location or is debris? Is that a French term for greatness? Or, I mean, I agree, Bruce is a great name, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're both a little prejudiced there, I think. But uh, the, oh, yeah. the, the original name was De Brouse, D E, capital B R A O S E, and that's a place name in Normandy, France. And that's usually how people got their sort of last names back then was place names. Right. And so the first Robert of De Brouse came to England. And he, was, he, he became known as Robert De Brouse, and it was sort of anglicized to De Bruce. And that's where the name comes from. Okay, thank you. Um, by the way, the Earl of Elgin, who some of you may have heard speak at the uh, at the uh, St. Andrews thing, I was about 20, I spoke there about 20 years ago. I don't, don't quote me on the date, the Earl of Elgin. He's the head of the Bruces today, and he's uh, probably descended from someone who was called a cousin by King David II, Bruce's, Robert the Bruce's son. Not a descendant of Robert the Bruce himself, but from a junior line of those Bruce's, Lord of Avondale. I should tell you a little bit about, you know, the long shanks of the movie. Maybe you'd be interested to know a little bit more about that. Uh, Edward the First is, is done brilliantly, by the way, by Patrick Magoon in the movie. Is shown as this, well, obviously brilliant, but also pretty much a monster. 
but uh, from the English point of view, um, he was known as the hammer of the Scots, not as a monster. And in fact, he was the first English monarch to really summon a parliament. He was a brilliant general, a brilliant leader, which is sort of brought out in the movie. But he was also a man who could command loyalty. And one story I love to, to tell is in uh, early in one of his early invasions of Scotland, the English army under his command take the town and fortress of Berwick. And, um, you know, he knocked down the walls and he sets his army to repairing the walls and build it up again so he can use it as his own fortress. And Edward I was 60 years old at the time, which is ancient by the standards of the time. And even though he was ancient, even though he was the king, the morning when the soldiers started rebuilding the castle and hauling stones and bricks up, who was working beside him with a wheelbarrow hauling bricks and stone up to the castle mounts, but the king himself. Now, kings didn't do that then or now, but he did. And that's just a mark of what kind of leader he was and you know why he got his orders obeyed so well and why his soldiers followed him so faithfully. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of the other side of the story of Braveheart. We shouldn't take it as a uh, gospel history. It's entertainment based on history, but sort of loosely based on history. Uh, oh, uh, King Robert was reputed to have a few, at least one daughter out of wedlock, by the way. Uh, but when he was married, he was faithful to his wives, by all accounts. Bruce, I may be fabricating this in my dotage, uh, but if, if I recall from the film Braveheart, wasn't there uh, a kind of a salacious uh, detail that uh, Edward I uh, took his daughter-in-law to bed? Or is that something that I've created in, over time? I think I recall that he was at least uh, aggressive toward her. Do you recall that? Uh, very much so. There's a, a Scottish voiceover, I forget whether it was Mel Gibson or not, suggesting that uh, Edward II wasn't doing his uh, princely duties uh, toward his wife and that if the, the royal... English royal line was supposed to continue that Edward, the, the fa his father would have to do the job for him. There is no evidence of that. And in fact, Edward I was one of the few kings of England who never, well, he was married at the time, his second wife. He was never unfaithful to his wives. And in fact, he adored his second wife and uh, built a monument to her after she died. Uh, plus, um, the future Edward II had several younger brothers, too. So the royal line was going to continue no matter what Edward II did, the future Edward II did with his uh, wife. And in fact, he had, I think, four children with his wife. So um, not until a couple years after we're talking about, but... Uh, um, he did, he did have a uh, sort of yen for handsome young knights, which made him very unpopular. Uh, plus, not just that, but the fact that he made young knight, you know, in the movie, again, this young knight is sort of a substitute for an actual guy named Piers Gaveston, who, uh, and in the movie, they, he makes this young unknown knight commander of the British, of the English army, which... You know, obviously, all the nobles and veteran generals of Edward the, the First uh, were just appalled by this kind of uh, conduct, and that led Edward the future, Edward the Second to become very unpopular even before he was uh, king. But no, Edward the First would not have done that. Um, he actually went on a crusade when he was Prince of Wales, you know, to the Holy Land. That's uh, he considered himself in some ways a very stout Christian defender and Christian.
a brilliant presentation. Uh, well, let's see Bruce. if there's any questions in the chat. Do you recommend a reference for learning about William Wallace? Uh, oh boy. Uh, this is from David Terrell. Uh, recommend a reference about William Wallace. Well, you almost, again, if you, I said in the, in the thing that very little factual is known about Bruce by modern standards, and he's the king. There's even less known about Wallace. We, we know sort of who his father was, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Malcolm Wallace, but um, most of it is from the legends of blind Harry and Barber from 50 or 60 years later. Uh, the McNeil, the Scott, the Scott, Mc, Ronald McNeil Scott book that I recommend has a, a chapter basically on Wallace and summarizes what we really know about Wallace. Um, I can't recommend a specific biography of Wallace offhand, but I'm sure if you go online, uh, you'll be deluged with William Wallace books and and probably William Wallace beer and ale and maybe Scotch whiskey. I don't know. Uh, but there'll be a lot out there, I'm sure. I did see somewhere that there is a William Wallace or a Braveheart uh, Scotch whiskey. I, I would not comment on the quality of the product, however. Well, I'm willing to go with you and do some research <laughs> to verify, you know. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I know Benny's has three Floyd's uh, Robert the Bruce Ale, so uh, that I can recommend for sure. I have uh, I have one book on William Wallace, William Wallace Braveheart by <clears throat> James McKay. Anybody wants to uh, peruse that? If I recall, it was, it was very interesting. That's my source for the proposition that he was uh, very tall. I can't recall the specific reference, but um, it's a good history. So for what it's worth. Yeah, one of the things I should note with size that he, everybody says he was a very tall, strong man and a great warrior, personal warrior. In those days, they didn't have foot measurements that were standard like everybody else. And that wasn't until the 1800s where the foot was officially 12 inches, the 12 inches that we know of. Uh, there's a story about Napoleon. You hear about Napoleon, the Napoleon complex. He was really five foot two and he was a short guy. And that's because, and that's made him all arrogant and, you know, uh, sort of aggressive because he's trying to compensate for his height. Well, this is 1800. And he, yeah, he was five foot two. French measurement, but he was actually five foot seven in the foot that we know of. The French had a different inch and foot that we than England had at the time. So he was actually of average height. And you know, if the measurements are that off in uh, eighteen hundred, imagine imagine what the measurements would be in thirteen hundred. There was just no one standard measurement from, from city to city or from country to country let alone, you know, relating to the foot that we know today. So somebody might have actually said he was six foot seven, but the foot that they're talking about is not necessarily the foot that we understand today. Hope that sheds, a, you know, some context to the, uh, the six foot seven idea. Um, Is there any more in chat here? Other questions or comments, commentary. Okay, is there a is there a good Robert the Bruce genealogy genealogy group to connect with? Uh, not that I know of a specific group, but um, uh, except maybe for the the royal family of England and Scotland. I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, because. You know, except for the royal family and the, the Bruce's Earl of Elgin, those are the only two uh, even close to male line descents of this Bruce family. But I think there'd be a million descendants of, of the older Bruce families. 
um, no genealogical group that I know of. Anse if you go down to Ancestry.com, you'll see perhaps. Uh, okay, here's another observation. The armor on display at Sterling Castle gives you sort of an idea as to height and uh, uh, probably not a six foot seven height. No, that's, uh, you know, uh, people were on average probably two inches shorter back then than they were today. I have a reputation for tall tales. <laughs> Very appropriate, yeah. Uh, and, you know, the blind hair, you know, the stories about Bruce's single comments and that, they're passed down in oral tradition probably for 50 years until blind Harry and Barber set them down in verse. Uh, I think Barber actually claimed to know, to talk with people who, who actually had lived with and knew the Bruce. Uh, one of the sad things about his life is that evidently he got leprosy late in life. Mm. And so the last year or two, he was uh, disfigured <laughs> uh, by the diseases and arguably died of leprosy. Uh, the one good story, if we have the time, we have one minute here. Uh, the Bruce told his great companion, Sir James Douglas, to take his heart from his body, cut it out, and bring it on crusade. And the Black Douglas did it, and a few Scottish knights went on crusade against the Muslims in Spain. And supposedly they routed the Muslims, but Douglas ran ahead of his, galloped ahead of his forces and got ambushed. And Douglas died fighting with the uh, heart of his Bruce in a locket around his body. And the but lock. And the heart was brought back to Scotland by the survivors. Well, Connie, I guess it's all yours. Well, Bruce, outstanding, outstanding, spectacular presentation and very thorough, which is, I think, why we had fewer questions than usual. So we just can't thank you enough. And we will look forward to your next presentation. I think you you said you might speak again in 2024. So uh, we'll be waiting with bated breath. So thank you so much. And uh, I do want to thank Jack uh, Sanders for everything you do for us, Jack. You're, yeah. you're just an invaluable resource. So thank you. And Gus, thanks for the words of inspiration. And friends, thank you for being here today. And uh, please join us again next month on March 11. Same time, same station. And until then, stay safe and thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Connie. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.